The universe is still a place of mystery and wonder. As a cosmologist, I'm exhilarated that we can make some progress towards tackling what seem very fundamental questions. These programs focus on was there a beginning, whether we are alone, what's the future of the cosmos, what is the nature of reality. With each advance, new questions come into sharper focus. The key issue is what we still don't know. Surely, of all the great questions, it has to be for the next century or more, are we alone? How could you help but wonder whether you're alone? In fact, at the moment, what we're doing is sitting here waiting for them to contact us. And maybe everybody's just I waiting they're, around they're, waiting. They're all doing this. <laughs> it's preposterous to think that we're the only ones. If there really is a, a lot of intelligence out there, why is it we don't see it? Why isn't it obvious to us that it's out there? It is now no longer premature to ask questions about whether life exists elsewhere. And so recently, we had no idea how likely it was that there were other planets like the Earth. We had no idea about whether they would have life on them. We still are groping for answers, but it's no longer quite so absurd to focus on these fascinating questions. For 40 years, searching for extraterrestrial intelligence has meant radio telescopes scanning the heavens for a signal sent to us from an alien planet. But now we are starting a new phase. Instead of passively waiting, hoping to pick up a signal from them, we are now actively looking for them, for the planets where life might exist. Some people believe the universe is teeming with life, even life like us or more advanced than humanity. Some people believe that Earth is essentially unique, the only place. We here on Earth may be in a unique environment, or there could be biospheres like ours spread through the galaxy and far beyond. Seth Shostak is one of the leading investigators at SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and believes the sheer size of our galaxy tips the scale in favor of life. An enormous number of stars. There are 10,000 billion, billion stars that we can see with our telescopes. That's a big number. That seems like an awful lot of universe to only have something happening at one spot. That just doesn't sound right. That isn't the way astronomy works. The problem is, no one actually knows how many other stars have systems of orbiting planets. Because orbiting planets are hard to see. But astronomers are making headway. It's actually hard to find planets. When planets go around a star, they cause the star to dance a little bit. You just stare at them for years at a time. And see if any of them for a few hours gets slightly dimmer because some planet has moved across it making a little eclipse. We've only been at it for a short while and we're just reeling them off and we are still very limited in the kinds of planets that we can discover and yet there are over I think something like a hundred or 120 planets that have been found. Th that number per se is not so interesting. What's interesting is the percentage. We now know that at least one in ten stars has planets and right away that tells you there are billions of other solar systems just in our galaxy. Out of the billions of solar systems, which should we look to for signs of life? Is our type of planet likely to be the only kind capable of sustaining life? We mustn't be too 
parochial in imagining where life might exist on giant planets, where there might be life floating in a dense atmosphere, for instance. We should even look in interstellar space, where there could be cold objects which uh, uh, have some sort of uh, underground biospheres. But the only place where we know life has evolved, of course, is here on Earth. It makes sense to look at planets which we feel might have resembled the young Earth, uh, because there, in principle, the same processes could have happened which uh, we believe happened here on Earth. What you're looking for is the kind of world that could have liquid oceans on its surface and maybe a bit of an atmosphere. We look for Earth-like worlds simply because we know something about Earth-like worlds. We know that they can cook up life. Just look out the windows here, right? And uh, consequently, in, since we know that, at least that's something. That allows us to have a plan, if you will. And that plan is to look for the most important element to life like us here on Earth, water. But looking for Earth-like, water-based planets has a consequence. Some scientists believe that planets that retain liquid water may turn out to be a rare breed. Keeping water on a planet is a dicey proposition. There's a large number of geological reasons that planets lose this ability to keep liquid water. And that's what a lot of people who are in the astrobiology game, especially the astronomers, don't get. The ability to keep water is a temperature phenomenon, and it d relates directly to the distance from the sun. Too far away, it freezes. Look at Mars. Too close to the sun, it boils away. Let's look at Venus. It is a Goldilocks sense. You have to be just right if you are to maintain liquid water over time. Which means that of all the other solar systems out there, only those with a planet at the right distance from its parent star, so that water stays liquid, will do. But others believe that even those may not be so rare. The range, the range of orbits in which water would neither be frozen all the time or boiled away is, for a star like the sun, it's not so narrow. It, it, it runs from maybe just beyond Venus to just inside Mars. So the chances that some planet in the solar system would be in that, what they call a habitable zone, uh, are not, not minuscule. If only one in 10 stars have planets, and only one in 10 of those will have a planet in the habitable zone. This still leaves a million, million Earth-like candidates. Even the skeptics agree, life will still be widespread. Enormous numbers of planets have to have life simply because the numbers are so huge. When you think there's 400 billion stars in our galaxy alone, and there are billions of galaxies, we now think that virtually every star is a planet, more than one planet. You're going to have abodes for life almost everywhere. It's ridiculous to think it happened on this planet and this planet alone. Life is definitely out there. There's the real prospect that within the next decade or so, we'll learn at least something about potential life beyond the Earth. It may just be simple life elsewhere in our solar system. It may be evidence that there's a biosphere on a planet orbiting another star. It seems that it is only a matter of time before we find another Earth-like planet. But then what? Can biology tell us what kinds of alien life will have evolved there? Until now, the conventional wisdom was that the possible forms of life outside our planet were limitless, the stuff of unfettered speculation. Science fiction writers who actually bother to get the science right worry enormously about the physical science. They get the planetary orbits carefully calculated. They, they, they really, really try and get the physics right, you know, apart from the, the warp drive or the extra gadget they've thrown in. Yeah. Uh, but then when it comes to the biology, they, they suddenly act as if it's not a real science and you can, you can make biology up as you go along. Everybody knows biology. After all, we are biology, they think. So, that all the things I know that are really obvious, I mean, it's obvious that if you're going to be cold and calculating, you've got to be reptiloid. And if you're going to be purring at things that happen in the plot, then you've got to have feline somewhere in your ancestry. And they talk such absolute nonsense. 
and they've been tempted to talk such nonsense because the sheer variety of life here on Earth suggests that when it comes to designing creatures, anything is possible. Biology has been notoriously immune to general laws. It's an unholy mess. It's an absolute, well, you know, it's all soup and it's all sort of squashy things which never do the right things. And, and I think there's a lot of truth in that. And it's, that's why I think it's very difficult to see behind this screen, I mean, this, this riot which is the biosphere, and try and tease out the particularities, the things which really make life tick. In one sense, we do know what makes life tick. It's evolution. The problem is that evolution doesn't seem to obey any rules. From giraffes to kangaroos, creation seems to be a free-for-all. If biologists could find some underlying pattern in natural selection and evolution, if they could find some rules which uh, governed it and constrained it, then we might have a clearer idea how likely it is that uh, simple life will evolve into greater variety, perhaps even greater complexity. Some people are at least starting to think about whether there could be basic underlying rules governing what has happened in the Darwinian process on Earth. Somehow there's this view that each species is somehow the result of some uh, almost drunken, random walk. Evolution is, like this uh, famous phrase, the blind watchmaker, just um, with, with no purpose. It is just uh, there's some tinkering going on, and then it produces some new species, and then you move over here that tinkers, and it makes another species. Evolution is meant to be a free-ranging process. It's not meant to have destinations. And in one sense, that must be true. There's no way that evolution can imagine what should happen next. It is, in one sense, a blind process. Professional biology says, oh, well, if we ran evolution again on this planet, so different will be every mutation, so different will be every chance and choice that organisms have, that we would have a wholly different spread of creatures. And if there were no rules or patterns we could extract from evolution on Earth, then how could we possibly predict what this seemingly random process might create on other planets? But some scientists do now think there are patterns and rules underlying evolution that will help us to predict alien designs for life. I believe that it's not just uh, theory, the lots and lots of new kinds of evidence that can be deployed about how life evolved on Earth and perhaps even about how life might have evolved elsewhere. There are a, a set of universal principles governing the function, structure and organization of much of life. We believe maybe most, almost all of life. These laws are not some diabolic accident that occurred in the random process of evolution. Quite the contrary, they form part of the landscape upon which evolution has taken place. So it sort of turns everything around. Instead of stumbling aimlessly across a featureless terrain of possibility, perhaps evolution is following the contours of an invisible landscape, a landscape that channels creature design. If indeed there's an invisible landscape, then perhaps that invisible landscape is a universal. It's not just on this planet, it's on all planets. And if that was true, then that might begin to suggest that we have, if you like, rules of engagement which allow us to predict what evolution will throw up almost anywhere. And that's a really important shift, I think, in thinking. The landscape of rules in which evolution walks means whatever monsters evolution creates on other planets, they will still have to obey the same underlying physical rules as we do. So-called scaling laws, for instance, tell us that on any planet with an Earth-like gravity, we will never be confronted by giant horse-sized spiders. And it isn't just size. There are a host of curiously interrelated laws. 
if you look, and there must be 50 or more of these such laws, one of the most curious is to do with lifespan. No matter whether you're a tiny shrew, which fits on the palm of my hand, or a whale, which is bigger than the size of this room, in your lifetime, you have, roughly speaking, the same number of heartbeats. So that a shrew lives a year or so with an extraordinarily fast heart rate, and a whale lives for maybe well over 100 years with, with a very slow heart rate, but they seem to have, roughly speaking, the same number of heartbeats, and that's about one and a half billion. So evolution isn't as entirely random and freewheeling as once thought. But Simon Conway Morris has gone much further, claiming that evolution is far more constrained than ever imagined. He has noticed recurring patterns within the biology of the living world itself, which even the constraints of the scaling laws on their own cannot explain. For instance, if you want to have an eye, then you've got to have some mechanism of bringing the light, preferably through a lens, onto a sensory patch. That's what we call the retina. Now, in fact, there are perhaps 40 or 50 different ways of making an eye. And if I go for a walk in the countryside and I see a fly, the fly is seeing me through what's called a compound eye. That's lots and lots of lenses all stuck together. And, of course, there are other sorts of eyes which are rarer. Some, for instance, are designed like a sort of telescope. Some use mirrors, all those sorts of things. But they're, if you like, sort of, you know, they're, they're small experiments. But if you go almost anywhere on the planet, you're going to find somebody looking at you through either a camera eye or a compound eye. And we know that the camera eye has evolved independently five, six, seven times. And a compound eye has evolved at least four times independently. So again and again, evolution rediscovers the same solution. There is no reason why an octopus should have eyes similar to humans. We have evolved quite separately for 500 million years, and our common ancestor was blind. Yet our random evolution and theirs have both converged on the same design of eye. Even more remarkable, they have even made use of the same chemical building blocks. The beauty of this story is it employs very specific sort of protein, it's called crystallins, that the crystallins, first of all, they evolved billions of years before there were any eyes. They've been recruited, they've been brought on board. And they originally evolved to protect bacteria, for example, from sudden insult. But the trick is that if we look at other eyes in other animals, like a squid or a lizard, they also use crystallins, but the crystallins have completely different origins. So crystallins, and there are probably 20, 25 different sorts, each one has been employed separately, but they all do exactly the same thing. So the net result, I think, is that eyes are inevitable. They must evolve. I think that wherever you go on any, to any distant remote planet, you open the hatch and somebody will be looking back at you through the eyes. There just isn't an alternative. It's not just eyes. Biology is littered with examples of what's called convergence, where evolution invents the same solution over and over. Things that have happened many times this, way ra this time round, like photosynthesis and flight and fur and sex and eyes and coming out on the land, all these things have happened in many different lineages. And it seems to me that if we ran evolution again on this planet, we would expect to see eyed, creepy things coming out on the land and then developing fur, and perhaps some of them later developing flight. Even more controversially, Conway Morris feels that convergence does not stop at the level of anatomy, but goes right down to the very chemicals of life. The question, how deep can you pursue convergence, is you know, what is the bottom level? One possibility is actually there are certain chemicals, I mean, chlorophyll, the, 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 the chemical used, the molecule used for photosynthesis by plants, that probably is a unique solution. And there are things which can deal with light, but they don't work like chlorophyll, and I suspect that's the solution. There isn't another one. Strangest of all, if Simon Conway Morris is right, 
then evolution on other Earth-like planets would be drawn to the same solutions and convergences. Even beneath their skin, in their blood, they would be made like us. In other cases, we use hemoglobin in our blood, which transports the oxygen, of course. There are plants, legumes, for instance, which also have hemoglobin. But it's quite likely that the hemoglobin that plant uses has evolved independently from the hemoglobin which we use. It is almost uncanny, it is almost eerie, the way the similarities pan out again and again when you look at the way evolution unfolds. It's very tempting to speculate that these principles are going to be true anywhere that life evolved. I think inevitably one can say an awful lot about the structure and organization of creatures on a planet that we may never ever be able to visit. But out there, there will be, if there is life, it will have a certain structure, it will have certain lifespans, it will have a certain range of sizes, and in fact, if we combine it with Conway Morris's ideas, that we could even begin to speculate on what are the boundaries of what they would actually look like. When, if we do discover other planets, little blue dots somewhere else, which have life on, and it has a biosphere, then my prediction will be that unless it is utterly unlike the Earth in some peculiar fashion, it will have something which is eerily similar to what we see here. Not only will it have flying organisms and swimming organisms, not only will it have chlorophyll and forests, and not only will it have bacteria and also advanced animals, but it will even have something which I think will be curiously human-like. Now, how precisely will it have five fingers? I don't think so. It's difficult to think it won't have some sort of head. It seems the nervous system is a jolly good invention. Probably quite a big brain, yes. Well, the eye's got to be close to the brain. So you can see that you begin to sort of cascade this argument down. It could be four-legged or six-legged, possibly, but at least two of those limbs almost certainly have some sense of opposability. And there, too, there's some evidence even the hand in a certain sort of way is convergent. At first sight, we might be feel, well, almost very wary. This is something which looks human but isn't. But I suspect that as soon as we get underneath that alien skin, we'll realize that it's basically us all over again. And my own private hunch, which is definitely unfashionable, but I think, in fact, it will be eerily similar to humans. Eerily similar. If there really are millions and millions of planetary systems in our galaxy, then almost certainly there'll be some planets which are basically like the Earth. But of course, even then, we don't know how likely it is that life's going to get started. We only have one example to go by. But in the case of our own planet, it seems that life took hold with exceptional haste. We went through a very nasty period from about 4.2 to 3.8 billion years ago, which we call the late bombardment period. The Earth was just pummeled with asteroids. And when this period started to tail off and ended, life seems to have appeared in the fossil record almost instantaneously. Certainly a very good argument that life started on this planet almost as soon as it could have. And this is, to me, is an extremely telling point. Either we were just the luckiest place in the world, or it's not that hard to do. It was live really quickly. It appeared fast. And that suggests that, you know, this is an easy process, and it's going to happen in a lot of places. In one sense, our planet is not exceptional. The Earth is constructed of the same 92 elements as every other planet in the universe. But was our Earth somehow uniquely hospitable to what is otherwise a fantastically unlikely and difficult transition from chemistry to life? If so, life may still have never made it on other planets. Well, there is a possibility 
that life is that difficult to start that on a planetary surface the size of Earth, it only began once by some immensely uh, random event that just uh, was extremely improbable. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that there is a set of physical and chemical principles that lead uh, automatically to something that we would call a living structure. Soap bubbles are incredibly improbable. If you took the odds that every molecule in a soap bubble had to be at a specific point in time you know, to make that bubble, the chances are immense that it would never happen. And yet anybody that wants to can blow a soap bubble. It's very, very improbable by one set of mathematical laws, but it's very probable in terms of physical laws. Certain kinds of molecules that were plausibly present on the early Earth have this property of self-assembly. If you give them a chance, they in fact are able to produce structures that we recognize as part of the life process now. And what's more, those chemical precursors to life exist in space, on grains of stellar dust. Life's essential building blocks are found throughout the universe and don't need a planet at all. Absolutely, it's amazing. 30 or 40 years ago, the bet was there was absolutely nothing in interstellar stellar space. It was, it was a void. And then some radical people actually proposed that there were compounds out there. And, and furthermore, there are organic compounds. And I think this was treated as, as something very radical and sort of crazy. And now those have been found. And again, to me, what is fascinating is that there's a big overlap between these compounds that are found in interstellar space and what you would find if we took a an earthworm on the earth and ground it up. Things like amino acids and the components that go into making nucleic acids, things like DNA, which really defines life on earth. That these are just made naturally in space. Every time you make a bunch of planets, you probably make this stuff and it rains down on those planets. So in a sense, you may have already gotten the chemistry going for life. There's every reason to suspect that the same basic chemicals that we find on Earth and which are the precursors of life may exist uh, on other planets. Once those chemicals are in the environment of a planet, then there's the possibility that they react faster. So the key question is getting from those chemicals to something that we call alive. Here's a piece of meteorite. This fell in Murchison, Australia, about 30 years ago. It's called the Murchison meteorite. Now, this meteorite never saw anything alive, and yet it's got amino acids in it. We find fatty acids. We find uh, the, a few of the bases that we find in DNA. It's got the components of life delivered to the Earth. When we analyze this, about 2% of the mass of that is organic material. So there's some set of physical laws that leads chemistry toward the molecules that are part of the living process today. I think it's uh, very clear from our understanding of how the Earth formed and how this kind of material is being brought to the Earth that this would be a universal process. Which would mean on other watery, temperate planets. Not only could we expect life to start, but astonishingly, that alien life and evolution would start from the same chemistry as life on Earth. Convergence, anyone? Whenever someone said we had to look for life as we know it, that it simply showed a failure of imagination. You know, why not silicon-based life? Why not titanium or you know whatever? Um, and the answer is that it's not a failure of imagination. We seem to be composed of the language of the universe. Of course, the only way to test this theory, that they would be built and would look like us, would be to find life on another planet. And we may need to look no further than Mars for the proof. It would be truly profound if we discovered life on a neighboring planet. Uh, there's a little bit of methane floating around in the Martian atmosphere that shouldn't be there. There's a little bit of ammonia in the atmosphere that shouldn't be there. These things have only two possible sources, volcanoes, and yet we think Mars is a dead planet, and something alive. This methane is indicating to us that underneath that very sterile surface, there are some bacteria living there. 
And that would be incredibly interesting because that would tell you right away, hey, next planet out also had biology. Biology is just really commonplace. The important question is, can we find evidence for two separate origins of life? Discovering life on Mars, if it happened twice in a single planetary system around a single star, provided, and this is a very important proviso, that we can show it was of independent origin, that would address one of the major uncertainties about life in the universe, because it would then tell us that simple life, at least, was widespread in the cosmos. But it's not a foregone conclusion that life on Mars did have a separate origin. One possibility, which really is not as crazy as it sounds, is that life arose, say, on Mars, where we think the conditions were better during some of the nasty period on Earth. So it could have taken a hold there and then been transported to Earth, say, on a meteorite. You know, you take some of these microbes, these guys are tough. You put them inside a rock so they don't get zapped with all the cosmic rays and so forth in space. You put them inside there, okay, and, and they go into kind of a dormant phase, a spore form, and, and, and then you try and thaw them out, if you will, or actually add water, uh, 10,000 years later, and they're still okay, right? So it's very possible for life to go from one world to the, to the next without building rocket ships, as long as it's very simple life. So that's possibly number one, which is certainly very interesting, but not nearly as interesting as possibility two, and that is that any life on Mars represents an independent origin, because all of a sudden then, we as biologists have a second data point for life. And so immediately we want to know, in what ways is it similar to life on Earth, in what ways it's different. Any ways that it's similar suggests that maybe this is how life has to form. Um, if it's totally different, we start to see other options that are beyond things that we could have imagined. That, to me, is the most exciting. There's life on Mars, and it's not us. But even if life is not as unlikely as once thought, even if there are other biospheres of primitive life out there, it still leaves us with another question. I think there'd still be a quite separate issue of how likely it would be that any of those other planets have just insects, or they have just uh, microcellular organisms, or would they have evolved into something as complex and interesting as what's happened here on Earth? How long does it take to go from a bacterium to a radio astronomer? This is really one of the really interesting points. Again, we can look at the history of life on planet Earth. Uh, it took us three billion years to go from a bacterium to an animal. If you're going to be based on organic carbon, but most of the carbon in the universe is inorganic carbon, at some point, you're going to say, to be clever, to be really successful, I want to take some of that inorganic carbon and make my own organic carbon. So you've, you're making your own food source. So the clever organism now says, why don't I go eat it for dinner? And so you end up with a, what we call a herbivore. The next organism you would imagine would come along as, as one who says, well, you know, it's, it's a lot more nutritionally satisfying not to eat this organism that's making its own carbon, but to eat the organism that's eating the organism that's making its own carbon. Okay, so you now end up with a carnivore. And when I say carnivore, again, you, it could be a lion or it could be a paramecium. It could be an amoeba. On one level, Lynn Rothschild thinks part of the answer can be gleaned from how evolution here has involved a series of cause and effect steps which have bootstrapped life from simplicity to complexity you start to have the development of some kind of nervous system and some sort of coordinated swimming ability and larger and more and more coordination, and you're on the road to having something that perhaps is intelligent. Once you buy the fact that life's based on organic carbon and that you're gonna use liquid water as a solvent and that life is basically lazy and is going to be limited for inorganic carbon very quickly, you can develop a generalized argument that I think would happen in multiple places. Although life here on Earth has evolved from simple bacteria to complex animals, there's nothing in evolutionary theory to say that on some other planets it wouldn't get stuck at the level of pond life. We certainly have a long period of time when we've had cells on this planet. We go 3.5 billion years ago. Why didn't we have within a half million or a half billion years, say 500 million years, animals? Nevertheless, once life has started, the drive towards complexity may be inevitable. 
why on earth is it that when you start getting life on a planet, you get some things exploiting others, and then the whole thing seems to build on itself, and you get a great increase of diversity? It seems that there must be an engine somewhere within this that says, go ahead, flower, diversify. Natural selection essentially says that you, nature pick, picks the best thing around, the, best, the thing that works. Um, it's not clear from that why you shouldn't just get one species, one, you know, the best organism for, for the planet, you know. Why aren't we completely overrun with lemmings or cockroaches or whatever, you know, a, a, a monoculture. I think that there was a, there used to be a feeling that unless things were pushed, they didn't go anywhere. But I think Ian has produced a piece of mathematics which has changed our mind, which has turned over our ideas about the naturalness of a diversity engine. If things look as if they're going along in a boring way that can go on forever, stresses of various kinds may be building up in the system. Now, mathematically, we know it's a very almost universal phenomenon in mathematical systems of, of that general kind. As these stresses build up, at some point, you will get a sudden change in the way the system is mm -hmm. behaving. It will quite quickly change to something dramatically different. Uh, it's called a bifurcation. Depending on just how rapidly and how much you make that wobble, the pendulum does all sorts of crazy things. The system passes some threshold and it clicks into a new state. It can suddenly switch from one frequency of swinging to a totally different frequency of swinging, for example. It can go chaotic. This is an enormously widespread form of behaviour. This is the default, this is the norm. This is not the surprise. And this is natural, this is what the world is like. This is how the world works. This is yes. not a surprise, this is the default. This is what you should expect. These phenomena are universals. They are things that are going in general terms to happen anywhere they can happen. If there's a distant planet, if it's got the kind of chemistry that can produce life forms, uh, if the life forms get going, unless something strange happens to stop them, they are going to go through this evolutionary process Pushing which will each other. push and they'll push each other. The diversity engine will push them apart. Yeah. That's a mathematical universal. There will be a, a richer and richer um, ecosystem and it will evolve faster and faster. It will either hit the buffers and crash or it will keep going and some of them surely are going to go th right through to intelligent creatures and very intelligent creatures. So we now think life will get started and may even be driven to evolve complexity. But is advanced intelligence an inevitable product? Even if natural selection leads to a complex variety of life, then I would have thought it's still an open question whether any of that complex life displays what we call intelligence or not. People have re repeatedly said, whatever happens out there, it will not be intelligence. Intelligence is an evolutionary fluke. It's a one-off. But now we know that can't be correct. Why? Simple, because intelligence has evolved multiple times. Laurie Marino studies how brain size and intelligence have evolved over many different lineages, from invertebrates to mammals. The dolphin brain and the human brain are both quite large. In fact, the dolphin brain is larger than the human brain. Both became large independently in different ways. The last common ancestor between humans and dolphins lived about 95 to 100 million years ago. And that organism was about the size of a rat and had a brain that was about this size. And this is a rat brain, not very different from what the common ancestor's brain was like. Now, this is an intelligent animal, but this animal is not capable of self-awareness in the same way that 
we recognize it. A hundred million years later, we have these two large brains. Now, what's amazing about that is that not just that these two large brains are intelligent, but that they have both converged upon the same extremely rare capacity in the animal kingdom, and that is self-awareness. And that's extraordinary because there's no reason why two 100 million year divergent lineages of mammals should arrive at the same solution. So at some point, perhaps, self-awareness may be inevitable. How you get there may be different. If intelligence is another convergent property of evolution, then on any planet, its appearance may be simply a matter of time and survival. Out there, some planets are going to have just microbes. Some planets are going to have organisms that are smarter than us and everything in between. In my heart, I can't help but believe that there are not only other intelligent species, but perhaps many of them. There are just too many planets out there. So I, yes, I suspect indeed there are alien intelligences. Life started almost as soon as it could have just isn't an alternative. There's some tinkering going on. It's preposterous to think that we're the only ones. I can't help but believe that there are other intelligent species that perhaps so may awareness may be an evidence. Curiously human life, which is eerily similar. If there are other technological species out there, then they, like us, will eventually clamber and grope their way off their planet and realize that space travel is possible. But on their way down from that high, they will ask themselves the same question we did. If space travel is possible, and if our evolution can't be unique, then where is everyone? We know from astronomy that there are some stars rather like the sun, but two or three billion years older. And you might have imagined that life would have had a head start on a planet around one of those ancient stars. This is really one way to present the so-called Fermi paradox, first uh, proposed by the uh, great Italian physicist Enrico Fermi, who just asked the question, why aren't they here? Now, would E.T. be aware of, a, of the equivalent Fermi paradox, you know, the Zork paradox, whatever he called it? I mean, well, he would at a certain stage of his development. Any civilization out there that you know, develops technology and the ability to kind of eavesdrop with some sort of big telescope on the heavens, the first thing they're going to notice is that it's not obvious that there's anybody out there from their point of view. And they might worry about that, as we have. There's, there's something called the Fermi Paradox, where we say, hey, look, if there really is a, a lot of intelligence out there, why is it we don't see it? How come we don't trip across it? Why isn't it obvious to us that it's out there? There are solar systems which are at least a billion years older than our solar system. They've got a billion year head start in the race towards intelligence. Surely some of them will survive. Surely some of them will become space colonizers. So where on earth are they? The time it takes to sort of colonize the galaxy, make your presence known everywhere, is very short compared to the age of the galaxy. There's several answers. I mean, one is that we're wrong. We're unique. We're alone. And maybe that's because the origin of life is just, you know, in itself a chance event. But talk to any chemist and they say it's inevitable. Maybe they always blow themselves up. Maybe, maybe, maybe. But there's a big galaxy, there's a lot of planets out there, and we should not be alone. Suppose in a, dis you know, a, a, a th thousand light years away, there are a bunch of intelligent creatures at this very moment saying, well, look, if there were alien creatures out there that were intelligent like us, then they would have come and visited us, wouldn't they? Why aren't they here? And the answer is we haven't actually made the effort to go out there. And in fact, at the moment, what we're doing is sitting here waiting for them to contact us. 
And maybe everybody's just I waiting they're, around they're, waiting. They're all doing this. <laughs> Could the answer to Fermi's question be simply that life is spread thinly across a vast galaxy? I would love to meet aliens. It'd be great to have those wonderful, knowledgeable, big-headed creatures come down and give us world peace and fix all the food problems and take away all, you know, why not? Or even octopus-like creatures from Mars that are nasty ray gun shooting. At least the germs get those. But nevertheless, the best solution to this paradox is that there are very few of them, and they may be, as we, I think, will be, isolated in their own stellar systems. So the irony is that the very vastness of the galaxy, the sheer number of its stars, which convinces us that life will be out there somewhere, is precisely why we may never meet them. They are simply a very long way away. We have done ourselves a huge disservice by talking about three or four light years, which is the distance to the closest star. Anything that is only three or four seems small and manageable. What if you had to go to the nearest billion stars to find another intelligence? The Fermi paradox, if we ever solve it, will terrify us because what will be out there will be so different, so strange, so weird that I don't think we'd possibly know how to deal with it. Because if you have a billion year head start, and if indeed there's things beyond what we call intelligence, then it may well be that, you know, we are hardly worth noticing. So I find it a very interesting tension at the moment. You know, either we're completely lonely, which is rather dispiriting, or we are surrounded by, for want of a better word, an overmind, uh, which I think is equally dispiriting. What if we really are alone? I think that has enormous both scientific ramifications as well as theological. I mean, to me, that is almost scarier than the thought that we're one of, of many civilizations or, or many life forms in the universe. Because then one wonders why, if the physical and chemical conditions are the same elsewhere, and we know that's true, and, the, and time is on their side and so on, how come we're the only place where life took hold? So to me, that is a very scary, very sobering thought. In the end, if they do not find us, Perhaps it will be up to our descendants to find them. We can imagine that what you might call post-humans rather than humans could spread beyond the solar system. And so human life, that now restricted to Earth, could very well eventually spread through the solar system and far beyond. So what happens here and now this century may have a resonance that extends millennia or millions of years into the future and far beyond our solar system. Questioning the meaning of life, why are we here next Sunday at 8? You can explore the very limits of what we know about the universe at channel4.com slash science. Coming up, adultery, murder and a conspiracy to protect the most powerful man in the world. You know what they say about absolute power. Clint Eastwood and Gene Hackman star in our Sunday movie, next.